All right, welcome to another episode of China is not our enemy. And um, I really want to thank Madison. Uh, thank you for co coordinating this campaign so amazingly. It's it's a lot. It's uh, multi headed. <laughs> and I want to also thank our sponsors our um, our campaign is about growing a big tent that to end this aggression, it's going to take all of us. And we really appreciate our amazing coalition. And today, uh, some of them are co-sponsoring this conversation, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament UK, um, its um, partners in the International Peace Movement's resistance against the AUKUS Alliance, Show Up America, the People's Forum New York City, and No Cold War Britain. Um, I'm super excited to be today with the amazing Prabir Perkai <laughs> Yashka. Ah, um, water. <laughs> Tongue twister, I agree. And my mouth was right, so it wouldn't even move. <laughs> the, he, he's the founding editor of NewsClick India. He's an engineer and a science and free software activist. He's a prolific speaker and writer globally and was with Code Pink on our Gaza Freedom March in 2009. He's the author, along with Vijay Prashad of Enron Blowout, Corporate Capitalism and the Theft of the Global Commons. Prabir, welcome and thank you so much for staying up late and joining us from India. Pleasure so to be start. with Coach Pink. Pleasure to be with oh, Coach Pink. Thank you, thank you. Um, I want to start with you letting us know what it looks like from India, as um, the US just lost another two wars and now it's aggressing on China. Um, and, you know, the United States citizens know about as little as India as they do about China. What, it, what does this look like from where you sit? Well, I think the there's one thing which, of course, affects directly in this particular case, the Indian people, that we have been having border tensions with China. This is a long unresolved border issue, stepping back really uh, to colonial times when the borders were not demarcated. And of course, that has spilled over as it happens in various countries into, uh, what shall we say, tensions, sometimes flashes into even violence. We had a 1962 war on the border. So that sort of complicates India's earlier attempts to build what would be called strategic autonomy, by which India did look after its interest, independent of joining any bloc. Now, of course, there is a much longer history to non-aligned movement, anti-colonial struggles, decolonization of the world, of which non-alignment was a part. But India kept out of alignments and built its own geostrategic autonomy. Right now, with the border tensions with China, it seems to have gone whole hog with the United States now. And that is cause for concern, because that's not in India's interest, it's not in the interest of the Indian people. So, um, uh, you know, the Indian people, the Chinese people, um, it's, a, it's a big, uh, it's, it's hard to say, right? Who are the Indian people? Who are the Chinese people? Um, but, uh, you know, India is right there in the middle of, uh, of what, what is said to be the, the century of Asia. Um, your, um, your, I, you're just kind of in the center of world politics. There's China, there's Kashmir, there's Pakistan and Burma. And, you know, and then it's, it's joined this quad. <laughs> so um, where do you see, you know, is, is, is being part of the quad um, uh, India's strategy is it U.S. pressure is where do you see um, India here? See, the current government that we have, the Modi government, is of course uh, has a longer lineage in the sense it comes from uh, the RSS, which wanted a rightward shift post independence itself. It wanted to be an ally of the Western powers against 
Russia and China, what it called the so socialism was its enemy. That's how it saw itself. And of course, wanted a Christian, Jewish, Hindu alliance against Muslims and communists. That is a very simple or a simplistic political understanding it seemed to have. Unfortunately, 50, 60 years down the line, that trend of thinking still persists. But initially, even when the Modi government came into power, it tried to have a relationship with the United States and the Western powers, but also tried to build some relationship with China and Russia, which now in the last two, three years seems to have collapsed completely. And it seems to be going much closer to the United States. Of course, there is also an internal set of issues which are here, as you know, the Indian uh, government has been as you said, Kashmir, as well as internal violence against minorities, the kind of politics that we see, divisive politics, that of course, Facebook very actively helps with uh, through its algorithms or otherwise. So all of this is also causing internal problems inside the country, weakening us in some sense, but also that going whole hog, whole hog with the United States particularly at a time when the US has just lost the Afghanistan war with after 20 years of occupation, getting out of Iraq, and also losing its, uh, shall we say, the larger Eurasian uh, landmass for itself. You have Western Europe, you have the NATO, and then you have the so-called pivot to Asia or Indo-Pacific. The Eurasian landmass is much bigger than the Pacific Ocean. And it's about should be about people, not about oceans. So I think that this is the wrong time. If you wanted to ally with the United States, this perhaps is the wrong century, if not the wrong time. Uh, yes, totally agree. And and also just the different the people in India. Um, I don't know if you know our listeners know that, but in recently, two to four hundred million people did actions on the same day in India. I mean, a historic day that few global writers wrote about. And you took on um, raising up the farmer strike. Uh, your coverage got you in a little bit of hot water. Can you talk about that? Well, you know, the government doesn't like critical uh, analysis of what it is doing or covering movements which are springing up in the country. So both these things are not something the ruling government wants. Of course, most ruling governments do not want criticism of itself. But the way this government has attacked, uh, particularly the digital platforms, which have resisted uh, the kind of massaging of the message, shall we say, the government has been trying. So that has actually led the government to take various measures. Digital platforms are definitely under attack because they seem to be more recalcitrant, more disobedient of the government than others, which have much bigger financial stakes. So easier to co-opt. So I think that is a reason why NewsClick has also come under various investigations as they're called. But other platforms, other journalists have faced charges of sedition for doing their everyday task of uh, journalistic uh, work. So I think we are seeing this but at the moment, we still have the courts functioning, some protection of the courts. And let's hope, you know, the Indian people will slowly uh, come out in support of the media and the courts will hold, hold the line. As, as of now, they seem to be at least thinking that free press, free media, journalistic endeavors should not be silent. So let's see where it goes. But yes, struggles on, the, on that front too. Well, do you think that that is an influence that comes from this relationship with the US? We're very used to not getting our news and, and journalists being shut down and jailed. Um, our, ours is really severe um, <laughs> with Julian Assange and Ed Snowden and Chelsea Manning and so many um, who uh, try to get the word out and, and, and get crushed. Um, is, do you think that this attack on journalism has anything to do with the relationship with the United States? Um, uh, you know, because what you're saying about the landmass, and not only that, the um, number of people, isn't, isn't that something like 4 billion people or 3.5 billion people in that region? Um, 
Well, if you take Asia, of course, it is very large. India and China alone will make it uh, roughly about 2.8 billion or so. So, of course, Asia is, in fact, the Eurasia is four fifths of the population of the world. Oh, wow. Perhaps, you know. So, and uh, if you add Africa, which is really shares corridors linked to Asia, then you really take it to most of the world's population. I wouldn't count Australia as a full-fledged continent, that leaves only the Americas out of it. So I think there is this issue of, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about the Eurasia as a landmass to Asia, what we are talking about a change of how the world has been looked at for the last, say, from the 16th, 17th century onwards, which saw the rise of maritime empires, unfortunately, colonial plunder, slavery, genocide, all the things we can think of, which today still plague us in different forms. But the power really shifted to maritime colonial power. So the United States, the European powers, West European powers were really uh, essentially maritime powers. And that is where I think this NATO being North Atlantic Alliance, and now we talk of Indo-Pacific, I think the focus is really force projection using your Navy. And of course, the aircraft carriers are really the fortresses on the little islands on the move, so to say. So I think this is the focus of the previous century, the 20th century. I think the 21st century is going to come back for what you were saying also, the focus on the people. And therefore, we are really looking at Eurasia. You are looking at the Americas as what we should be looking for, looking at Africa. And how do the people in these places, how do we really let that, those relationships develop and not big power projections and trying to do what is called a rule-based order where three G3, G5, G7 countries are going to decide what is called the international rules of the game. And I think that is the significant change we are seeing a corp can we have a cooperative world order emerge instead of Indo-Pacific and NATO? And I think that is the significance when you talk about what is happening and where is India going? If India thinks with its 1.2 billion people, it's going to go to Indo-Pacific, I think they're making a huge mistake. Wow, well, that's so hopeful, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm, I, I love that. And, um, you know, a lot of the work with China is not our enemy is also with the indigenous peoples in um, the Pacific Islands. Um, so I like the idea of having it, you know, the cooperative coming from the bottom. And, you know, that just brings me to the, um, we've spoken about this before, but the, um, the, the term that Biden uses, the rules-based order. And, um, you know, while breaking the rules all the time, how, you know, how do we undermine, obviously, you know, like Indo-Pacific, which is a, a recent term, you know, made by the, uh, I, I think it was the uh, Japanese officials and the Trump administration. Um, how, you know, how, what are other, what are ways like taking on the fact that it's not only not a rules-based order, but murdering, uh, mafias um how you know how can we switch that um around in our activism you know it's an interesting issue that when the united states about talks about a rule-based order or the ex-colonial powers with the united states talks about a rule-based order they're not talking of the united nations of the security council which is or even about international law all these three things are not on the table. So when you talk about an international rule-based order, the question is who makes the rules? And it's very clear, it's the G7, it's the G3. And all of these, if you look at it, are essentially ex-colonial powers, okay? And some of them are, of course, settler colonial powers. So when you talk about, for instance, US, UK, Australia coming together, now, what unites United Kingdom a has been power, of course, still has nuclear weapons and so on, but is really uh, long past uh, its prime. What has it got to do with Southeast Asia? 
So what is it doing coming into this? So it is to give the fig leaf that there are there is a rule-based order and a few countries set the rules. And the so-called revisionist powers are the ones who do not accept these rules. So the question that really comes in, what is the meaning of rules when you, as you have talked about, the mafias? Well, let's put it this way. The United States has seven to 800 bases in the world, military bases in the world. The only country which has this number of bases. Russia, which it thinks is a bad one, has 10. China has one. Okay. Now, this is the contrast. When you talk about the South China Sea, the freedom of navigation, you are talking about a corridor which is supposed to be close to the Chinese sea coast. You want to dominate that, talking about the freedom of navigation. And the, they're very clear, the 2018, I think, document, strategic document about China says we have a problem. We are not able to dominate the Chinese coastline or the first island chain. We're not able to dominate that. Outside that, we have dominance, but not inside that. We need that too. Now, those kind of uh, discussions that they're having, which are open, now, how does it square in with the so-called rule-based international order and this freedom of navigation as India discovered to its cost, supporting its South China Sea? The US Navy also did this freedom of navigation in Indian, what India calls its territorial waters or it calls its you know, uh, economic zones through which if you pass, you need to take permission. So all of these actually are interpretations US has over all these issues, which it says it decides what is the international rules. It's very clear, it doesn't say international law, by the way. And I think that's an interesting distinction it's making. It's not talking about international law, but about international rule-based order. And I think that distinction is very important. Thank you. Um, some good terms in there. Um, so India and Biden's quadrilateral, you know, the quad alliance with US, Japan, Australia, and India. You wrote an excellent article on India's role in the Quad and AUKUS alliance. Can you talk about the military components to the Quad Alliance? The Quad Alliance was initially a security dialogue, but recently both the United States and India has been talking about that this is not a India, it's not a in the Pacific equivalent of the NATO. We are not a military alliance. We are going to do all the soft stuff, economy, vaccines, and other stuff. But the military part of it, they sort of be walking back from. And it's also interesting that once you have the AUK US, Australia being brought into this, and let's leave out the poor United Kingdom, which gives them a fig leaf to say it is three countries. It's really inducting Australia as a frontline state in its contention over really Southeast Asia. Now, Southeast Asia is one of the most fast developing places in the world. They have a cooperative economy they're building with trade. They have trading partnerships with Japan, as well as with China, as well as with, the, with South Korea. So they see themselves as really the next growth zone in the world, which they seem to be doing as well. So I think inducting Australia in is to counterbalance, provide at least a base of operations if military target is what they have, as you said, China being the, their target. So Australia provides a military uh, staging post near Southeast Asia, and that seems to be Australia's attraction. Why Australia has gone with this is not clear, because Australia's economic interests lie with Southeast Asia and East Asia. It's a supplier of raw materials, and it needs industrial goods. And obvious, it is complements the Chinese economy well. So that has been where this has been selling stuff. So it seems that it is willing to pay money to United States to buy nuclear submarines, which it didn't seem to want because it didn't take the submarines from France earlier. It said, we want diesel submarines. Nuclear submarines are force projection. Why they do they want it for defensive purposes is not clear at all, but they'll get it 20 years later. 
it seems that they're offering bases in Australia for the United States Navy and Air Force. This is what the foreign policy uh, magazine also said, that this is the informal understanding. Why Australia is willing to pay money to be a frontline state in the battle, U.S.'s battle against China is not clear to me. And I think it's not clear to most of the Chinese, uh, Australian people too. Yes, uh, true. And there's an uprising, so we hope it succeeds. <laughs> so from British colonialism to Cold War Orientalism in the U.S., Nixon proclaimed that India needed a mass famine while Kissinger declared the Indians were bastards. India has been exploited and treated paternalistically by Western powers off and on for centuries. Today, the US sees India as geopolitically useful again as a hedge against China, as a market for US weapons and a market for US goods and outsourcing and for moving factories, for US factories from China to India. How do Indian government officials view this current political relationship and dynamic? Um, you know what, what? You know how does how is India's sovereignty and and agency expressed? Well, the two questions over there. One is, of course, how does India see United United States, and of course, its tensions or confrontation with China. That is one, particularly if it does it stretch from border to other issues. As long as it is border, it could be contained. If it goes beyond border issues, then of course you have a larger problem. Other is how does the United States view India? Now, you know, there is, I think an old saying, I don't know who said it. Uh, I think it's Kissinger, if I may be mistaken, who said to be a friend of the enemy of the United States is dangerous. The only thing more dangerous than that is becoming a friend of the United States. So. <laughs> This is when, this is when <laughs> their allies in Vietnam, South Vietnam, had to be dispensed with because they wanted to make peace over there and get out of South Vietnam. And I think the Afghan warlords have also discovered this bitter truth. So the United States has becoming an ally of the United States has always been extremely dangerous for that country, if not the warlords or the leaders of those countries. Now, if you come to the US issue, you know, it's interesting with the, what the time period, what you're talking about, Nixon, Kissinger, that's the 60s, the Indo-Pakistan war that took place at that point of time. Now, if you look at those times, the colonial powers were very unhappy with non-alignment countries like India, Indonesia, you had, of course, the coup against Sukarno and a carnage over there, which the US really uh, supported, instigated, whatever you call it. So all of this was very in interesting was you read the archives today, both the British colonial or post-colonial archives and the United States both had the same opinion that these countries, we're letting them come in, we can't stop them, but they really should not do anything except listen to us. In fact, the uh, British uh, archives say, the Commonwealth should be led by the senior Commonwealth countries, all of them white, settler colonialism or UK, and the rest of them should really listen to us. So at that point of time, they hated the Nehru uh, government, they hated non-alignment. They basically realized it was about decolonization. And that was the basic battle going on in the world. Now, once we move beyond decolonization, I think even the ex-colonial powers have accepted. They cannot get back to colonies. Now, the question is, what is the form of extraction that we can do? And you can see from Africa, what is the mode of exploitation they have? with countries that still think they can bulldoze, steamroller. And this is the difference I think they're finding with Asia, that Asian countries have, have by now uh, been able to come together. And that's why I was talking about the ASEAN, that in spite of their political differences, which is significant, they come together economically. Now that is the African Union was doing that and taking Gaddafi out and destroying Libya was the price of Afri African Union paid and Gaddafi paid for having brought African Union together. 
So, you know, you are still seeing those battles being fought. Unfortunately, countries like India, which pay, played an important role in rallying this third world, as we call it, the global south, for decolonization, that this has decided that the interest lies in completely real polit politic. That means, who do I dicker with purely transactionally and not look at the larger questions? Of course, it has its own problems with the, the kind of anti-minority politics the government is doing. It, it finds itself very easily in the same boat with the United States with its policy of uh, you know, war, global war on terror, and at least internationally, uh, anti-Islamic, Islamo, supporting Islamophobia. So that is also something which is uh, what is bringing the US and some of the settler colonial states together of basically supporting Uyghurs, uh, supposedly, while pursuing a completely Islamophobic line. But the only thing that has happened, which I think is a march of history, that if you look at West Asia, look at Central Asia, which are actually the dominant religion here is Islamic Islam, that you can see they are moving towards a greater understanding with each other and trying to work out something independently of global powers, particularly the United States. And the fall of Afghanistan, withdrawal of US partially from Iraq and possibly Syria, means that those forces are probably likely to work out how to solve our problems ourselves and not look to great powers for playing one off against the other. Now that in Central Asia, this is what Brzezinski was most worried about, that fall of the Soviet Union must be accompanied by capturing the Central Eurasian part. That means that is where the power lies, which is really Central Asia. And Afghanistan was for Brzezinski always the important element. That's why, if you remember, Brzezinski started the Afghan intervention in 1979, well before any of this happened. And who were his allies? Bin Laden's. You know, this is the this is the forces they the same Islamist forces which they went to war against in 2001 are the forces that propped up in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union and the progressive Afghan government. So, you know, this is the reality which is changing. And I think government of India or a Biden administration, or of course the Trump administration, who doesn't they're talking about, all of them are missing the march of history. The march of history cannot be delayed like this, but yes, there is no guarantee that barbarism cannot triumph and destroy civilization. And we have nuclear weapons and we have climate change. So we have two threats hanging over us and our civilization. Yes, exactly why we need cooperation instead of aggression and more weapons. Uh, that's our campaign. Thank you. Um, but I mean, that was kind of um, depressing. Um, I mean, what what's the view like? What do people say in India about this though? Because in, in what you just said, it's it's there can't be a lot of people excited that India is uh, on the side of the US and it's war in China. I mean, is, is, is that, how is that talked about? You know, one part of the Indian problem is that we are so big uh, in terms of size, in terms of population, that we think our problems are the biggest problems in the world. So unfortunately, we have that problem. International issues are seen from a very narrow lens. So one of the problems that we have is, of course, China, because we had a border war, a war in 1962, now we have the border tensions clashes that have taken place recently. Therefore, to vilify or make it out that China is an enemy internally. And anybody who says, like you were saying, that China is not our enemy, or people like us, we said, you know, siding with America against China doesn't make sense. Of course, immediately we call, oh, you are all pro-Chinese, which of course, then immediately puts out, out of the discourse. It's interesting, while they're doing that, what is objective reality? India, China trade has grown. 
in spite of India's best in, you know, efforts to come closer to the United States, the fact is the US is essentially deindustrializing, and it today controls intellectual property. Of course, it controls the financial systems of the world. It controls arms production, but beyond these three areas, it doesn't produce much. So therefore, our trade, in spite of all the uh, campaign against China, which is, being, which is there in India, the reality is our trade on both our selling to China and China selling to us is growing. Now, that's the objective reality. Will it make India change its politics? Will it have an impact internally about politics? We'll have to see. Unfortunately, the arc of history is a good term to use, but doesn't work in the short term. The other part of it is that United States. Now, you know, the Indian middle class has a different relationship with the United States than it had earlier. There is a lot of so-called non-resident Indians who are middle class, who have migrated to the United States, have a good life over there, and who have an outsourced, outsized influence over here. The Indian middle class always had its eye to the West. That is what it looked towards. And weakening, as I said, of the national, national movement heritage, anti-colonial heritage, that has also put us at the moment into this quote unquote, as I would call, navel gazing mode. What is India for? You know, we knew where we were going. We wanted to be an independent country. We would develop internally. Now we are being told, you know, technology we can always get from outside. We can always buy things and, you know, we can get dollars will come in. But are we as a nation, what does it mean for us? Is it a recolonizing process? We're not clear. So, you know, the, those issues still are very much there. On top of that, we have what we call communalism, which is really sectarian politics. And communal word in India is a bad word, unlike a lot of other places where it's thought to be communitarian. So here we mean communism by divisive sectarian politics based on religious identity. That's how the word is used in India. So this attempt to create a majoritarian psyche and disempower the minority. That is unfortunately the trajectory that seems to be taking place in South Asia and is being helped by small programs that are conducted in different parts. So the interesting part is unfortunately South Asia, this is something that has been happening for quite some time. So when the United States and the West sheds crocodile tears over the fate of minorities in Afghanistan, they have never shed the you know, same tears for the minorities in Pakistan, India, or even Bangladesh. It, it is instrumental when it comes to, say, Burma, which is you know, easily uh, sacrificed. It doesn't, they don't have any big stakes over there. But you don't hear the same thing said about these states where they seem to have much deeper stakes to use it against China or use it against each other. So I think those are the problems we have when we talk about how do the Indians look at all of this? Yes, there is resistance. Yes, there is struggle on these issues, but it is going to be a long, hard struggle because we have to reinvent the Indian nation that came out of our colonial struggle. And we have to reinvent the Indian nation. How do we build a secular, strong India, which is, doesn't want to look and either itself or the world in divisive terms, but tries to build solidarity with others as well as with each other. I think that is the biggest challenge we face. And this is a challenge which is, I think, a worldwide challenge, it's not That's only global. India. I think yes, it's a global definitely. challenge. Definitely global, um, but, but hopeful. <laughs> Thank you for that inspiration. But. Um, Prabir, I wonder if um, just to back up a bit, you 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 talked about, um, you know, what the U.S. not talking about what happens in India, and um, uh, if you could take that a little deeper, you know, like the what what does the violence in uh, anti-Muslim violence look like in India, and um, uh, wh why isn't that raised up? Um, you know, especially like I know when we, we were in the US, you know, raising up the concerns about Kashmir, what what keeps all that so hidden and, and quiet? What 
What I'm always curious about that. Do you have any ideas? Well, you know, the I I think the part of it is in India at the moment, the majoritarian discourse is strong. So even though news outlets like NewsClick and others talk about this, cover news in Kashmir, and it has been doing so for quite some time. And it has covered it to say that Kashmir is not normal, that all that is happening in Kashmir is something that doesn't happen in any other, any other part of the country. So this is something if they say, if the government says everything is okay, it is not okay. So that is the, you know, the, that's what we would say. It, we are not alone. There are lots of people who are saying it. But what has happened is that this voice is still at the moment defensive in the sense that the, the combination of government power, combination of money power, and money power is because the bourgeoisie is not going to fight for a secular India. It's going to fight for its secular cause, make more money. Okay, so therefore it has a stake in the government. And even if it dislikes what the government is doing, uh, the government can arm twist very easily if for a rich capitalist, you have a lot to lose. So therefore we can see that uh, they are not willing to uh, rock the boat. So they're getting into the major majoritarian boat, even if they don't like it. I'm not going to go into what is called the election bond scheme by which you can, big capital can give money and even foreign capital can give money legally to Indian political parties. And of course, the, the ruling party has got 90% of that money. Uh, so these are all the strategies which the, this government has done. So resistance therefore is now relatively uh, distributed in terms of, as I said, smaller media outlets raising their voices, movements on the ground under attack in different ways, the majoritarian voice plus the money power plus all the kind of discourse that we divisive discourse being propped up. The question is hatred is something which is easier to rouse. And unfortunately for us, uh, if you are trying to appeal to rational discourse, that takes time because hatred is easier. Hopefully it doesn't last too long. But as you know, hate, hatred is something which hatred and fear are much easier to appeal to and uh, rouse amongst the people. While bringing people together, building a rational discourse takes time. But I also believe that hate is short lasting. It doesn't last too long. Yes, you can do it for two years, three years, five years. You cannot do it more than that. So I do believe that everywhere in the world where we still, we are seeing now the rise of hatred, of course, fueled by social media, Facebook algorithms, we know that. But it's by, even that is a matter of time. How long can this hatred, which is being roused in different parts of the world, how long can that sustain itself? And I believe that is the struggle that brings all of us together whether your battle against Code Pink's battle, against no war, against peace, for peace, you know, against war, which has been a long standing battle of Code Pink, our battle of different kinds against social divisions, which of course is there in the United States too. After all, race is very much a part of the social fabric of the United States. I think all of this survive on hate. And survival on hate cannot be long lasting. This is what I think all of us have to believe in. And this is what we have, what we have to fight for. So I think the battles everywhere are similar. Oh, Prabir, <laughs> that was beautiful. I mean, yes, yes, yes. And so inspiring as we look out at, you know, so much so much devastation and hate and derision and things on the edge of the barbarism, as you say. So um, I could listen to you for hours. Um, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your wisdom and your brilliance. 
And um, everyone, you know, you can follow them every day. There's a lot to read and news click it to get smarter about India, as we all should be smarter about the world. Um, thank you. China is not our enemy. India is not our enemy. Yes, may we live in love and cooperation for the planet and for the future. So thank you, Pradeer. Thank you for letting me speak in this vein. <laughs> okay. This is a rare opportunity to speak to you. And you know, I hope we can keep this conversation going. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. Peace and love. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. And stay engaged. Um, and tonight, you can join us at um, 8 PM Eastern Standard Time for week seven of Coalition Peace Initiatives webinar. Uh, the series is co-sponsored um, on uh, the U.S. and China by um, uh, Pivot for Peace and Code Pink and many others. Stay engaged and keep getting smarter. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>